that. And so we just want to have them come forward. We have a couple of questions we want to ask of them and just let them be able to respond. Mom, do you want to say something? Just kind of share a little bit before. Um, yeah, go ahead and come on up. Uh, I'll just I'll just share this. The Bible says, oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. So I want to thank God that last week I did not break any bones when I fell down as I stepped over the dog and started down the stairs and had a four point landing. And I thought, well, uh, how am I going to get up? And You know, I just rolled over, got up and my uh, uh, hip was not broken. Praise God. And. Uh, so anyway, I, I had a pastor pay, pray with me and my husband last week, and we used the scripture in Job twenty two twenty eight I think, and it says, um, you decree and declare a thing, and it shall be established. And you know what we are decreeing and declaring is that Bill and I are never going to fall again. It said it'll be established. We're standing on the word. So uh, praise God. I want to praise the Lord for that. Well, and move the dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Here you go. She didn't say. She, she landed right on some rocks on her face. And. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> he was he was demonstrating what happened. <laughs> So, so dad, he likes to horse around. He likes to go, um, like when he goes to these church churches where they got like uh, armor bearers, he sees them at the front door and goes around to the back door and sneaks in the back door. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was down at this big meeting. I was standing on the front row down at and Mark and, and, and Trina's. Man, the place was full and everything. I'm standing on the front. Oh, I'm just worshiping God with all my heart. And it's... You know, you can do it really loud. The music's loud and everything. And, and I open my eyes and Dad's face is right in my face. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> he doesn't care that anybody else might see that. You know, it was, uh, it was just, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, back on track here. So there's, there's, there's things that they have understanding of through the years because they've kind of seen everything uh, pretty, pretty much. How many have already seen everything? I, I'm still going to see some more things, but, but just you know, in the church and whatnot, and and um, so one of the, one of the questions we had, and we're kind of we kind of broke it down a little bit, but a lot of times there's there's prophetic things um, that are from the Word of God, but then sometimes we'll get a, a personal word from somebody. Somebody will speak something over us uh, personally, and how to uh, how how to deal with that. Now, let me just read this says, is there a prophetic word you can say changed your life or a perspective you can say, thank you, Lord, for revealing this to me through your prophetic word? Oh, you know, in, uh, in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, uh, we see that there has been words given to individuals uh, by another uh, person by a prophet uh, or by an angel and uh, there's uh, there is uh, evidence that prophetic words are uh, are valid Amen. and uh, in the old, bo both Old Testament and in in the New Testament and uh, and I have had many words spoken over me and uh, uh, a lot of those words uh, I, I haven't seen the fulfillment of them yet. Uh, some of the words have been very encouraging to me. And I think, uh, I think uh, in the New Testament, where it talks about, about prophecy, one of the things that prophecy does in 1 Corinthians, uh, the 14th chapter, I believe it's the third verse, it says, uh, when... Uh, where one speaks in prophecy, he speaks to, to edify and to encourage and to comfort. And that's happened to me. Sometimes I've been at a crisis position in my life where I needed some help. 
and I needed, you know, I needed to hear a word. And words have come. Sometimes it's not just specifically to me, but to, in general, to the entire congregation or the people. And uh, it was just an utterance from God. And it spoke specifically to me at that juncture in my life. Just exactly what I needed. But I think maybe the life, most life-changing things that have happened to me as far as uh, words being spoken have sometimes come, you know, not necessarily recognized as a prophetic word. But uh, people that were on fire for God and loved God, loved people, and loved me, uh, they, they spoke into my life. And it wasn't just them. It was God speaking through them to me. And when they, when they did, it, uh, it was life-changing for me. I was talking to, what, is it Melody? Melody? Yeah. Melanie. Melanie, yeah. I was talking to Melanie this morning on the way over, and I remember distinctly when I was, uh, I was in the military, I was in the Army, and I just gave my heart to the Lord. And uh, I was... Uh, in the Baptist church, Ginger was Baptist, and so I was too. So <laughs> that meant, uh, you know, I got saved while going there. So, but uh, people that had such courage and boldness to get out on the street corner and play their instruments and sing and uh, and testify, those people spoke volumes into my life. And it was sometimes people that was just like a little wedge that uh, they inserted into my life that, that just drew me away from the things that I was practicing and drew me into the things uh, where God wanted me to go. And uh, sometimes it was just an individual speaking uh, courageously and boldly into my life. Sometimes it was the words that uh, brought about uh, an exhortation to make a change in my life. And sometimes those people, I owe my life to them. You know, and their obedience to God. And so a lot of times people, the, the things that really have brought about a distinct change and maybe changed the course of my life uh, came from people like that. So are, are you... Was there anything that was specifically uh, spoken that you're you're supposed to do this, you're supposed to go this way, you're going to become this, you're going to become that, um, or was it something that was more of a of an encouragement of something that was already in your heart? I think those uh, I think those things that you're talking about, you know, that changed the course. I'm going to do something. Were birthed in me initially before I ever heard anybody confirm. Uh, anything like that. It, it was never something that I made a choice be based upon a prophetic word, but it was something somehow that God had been dealing with me about and, and, and speaking to my heart about that uh, somebody nudged me the right way just by what they said. And it was, uh, you know, maybe it wasn't in Thus Saith the Lord, it was, but it was God. It was just God speaking through them to me. And I probably wouldn't have made some choices that I made had it not been, I realized, you know, God's using this individual to speak to my heart and to bring about change in my heart. I've made some big changes, not many, but some big time changes in my life. And, uh, I think of, uh, a lot of times they involved where I was to minister the next place I was to go or to be a pastor. And uh, I, made some, uh, I made some decisions like Jonah did. I, I went the wrong way. And, <laughs> and uh, I don't know if that's an encouragement to anybody, but I, I haven't always made the right choices. But I remember one time sitting in a church where I had, I had uh, put in my name 
to be that pastor. So in those days, we used to try out. You know, you'd go and try out in a church. And then, the, you know, then the people vote on you. You know, democracy type of deal. And uh, I remember God had been dealing with us to pioneer a church. Go into a little, a little town and, uh, and plant a church in that place. And so, I don't know, I, I, I went the other way. I like the mountains. I'm a, I'm a mountain guy. I like to hunt and fish and stuff like that. And so uh, if I was going to pick a place, you know, it's going to be where the streams are, you know, where you can fish and where you, you can hunt and stuff like that. So I wanted the mountains. We live in the Rockies, you know. And uh, so the thought had come to me, and the opportunity came to me, to go to a place where it's flat, the wind blows, and it's, there's not a mountain in sight. A few prairie dogs around, you see Prairie Dog Hill. But, you know, there was, there, there, there was no mountains around that. So what did I do? I pulled a, well, I got on the boat like Jonah did, and I headed across the lake. Actually, what I did, I went to the mountains, to Glenwood Springs, put my name in for a church there. While I was sitting on the platform, uh, the, uh, the, the one of the deacons was up there. They didn't have a pastor, of course. He was gone. But the deacons was up there, and, and uh, he was giving the announcements. And while I was looking at that guy, I thought, if I get this church, who's going to go to Burlington? And that's a place, I don't know, you know, where the wind blows. And uh, I realized I didn't want that church, <laughs> and I didn't get it, of course. And uh, so we ended up pioneering the church. And uh, from that little old windy farm country, uh, we planted a church. We never saw God move like that, uh, marvelously move ever in our lives before. And uh, I tell you what, a uh, guy came in uh, to the church. And it's a long story, but I'll make it short. And uh, he had oil wells. And uh, he, had, uh, he had been a poor farmer, but they struck oil on his property. And uh, anyway, he came into the, our church, and he wasn't even saved. And he said, you know, before he got, he got saved later, but he said, I'm going to give you half of my oil wells. Not me, but the church. He said, I'm going to give you half of the oil wells. And we dedicated a new church debt free. And marvelous things. He, you know, two guys in one week came and wanted to buy me a new car. So I just, <laughs> I put all the money together and drove a great big, uh, long, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was it was a big old boat. It was a Chrysler, New Yorker. Yeah. So anyway, we saw marvelous things. It wasn't just stuff. There was raised up out of there people who are pastoring churches today. Pine, there, there, there are people on the mission fields out of that dust of eastern Colorado that came up in that church. And so uh, God spoke to my heart and... Uh, then when we came, when we uh, went to the went to the mission field, uh, it was it was a big choice. I was 59 years old, had no means of support, nothing, and uh, and uh, I had been rejected from the mission field by my organization. I was 38 years old at that time, and he had to be 35, and he had to have no more than three kids, and I had five, and so. Uh, you know, uh, they, didn't send, they didn't accept me. But God did. When I was 59 years old, uh, I was, uh, I, I was uh, prompted by the Holy Spirit. Actually, about 58 years old, God began to start stuff here inside of me. And then there were words of confirmation. God brought people into my life that spoke into me and spoke into my heart. And... What they shared was so powerful that I realized these things they were saying were confirmations of what God had already put inside of me. 
And so, uh, 59 church, uh, 59 years old, uh, we left our church. So what, what was, uh, Thus saith the Lord, it was uh, divine connections yeah. and their relationship with us and what they were doing yeah. so that just made connections. So Another thing, too, when we began to sense this inside, Ginger and I every day would uh, uh, fast a meal. And we'd uh, go to the church, and we'd just pray and make sure that what I was sensing inside was not a whim. It was not just something that just came to me. It's a good idea. But it was something established in me to where it was actual so real that I could see myself going, leaving. Uh, we had a great church, and, uh, but saying goodbye to all of that. And launching out into the unknown, like Abraham, you know, God spoke to his heart, and he left his kindred and his land, not knowing where he was going, yeah. except he was going in obedience to God. And that was vividly portrayed and written and inscribed inside of me. And it was confirmed by various things, you know. But I think mainly... It was the Holy Spirit prompting me, birthing in me, and causing me to, uh, to be so re aware of it that I couldn't do anything else. Can I go? Let me just, let me okay. just say something real quick. Something I noticed you said at the beginning is some things haven't come to pass yet. Um, in the case of, of Abraham and also... I was just thinking of Paul, because sometimes the prophecies that you have given, and they might be legitimate, aren't positive. Um, it's like Paul, when he's getting ready to go to Rome, yeah. they said, you're going to be bound in chains. And he said, but God has given me another word also. And even when he got to Rome, um, those prophecies were fulfilled. He was bound in chains and everything else. But the real word that God gave him was never complete. It's being completed right now. You know, of of actually uh, the effect of his ministry wasn't um, yeah. he, he if he when he died if he would have he, he said I'm just pressing on I yeah. I'm going on as if that promise that was given me before is, is yeah. going to still be fulfilled I um, think you see you, you see over in the book of over in the book of Hebrews man I love to read the 11th chapter because it talks about men and women of faith and uh it talks about them, you know, living by faith, but it says that these all died in faith. Well, that's a good way to die. If you're going <laughs> to die, <laughs> die in faith. But, uh, you know, they, they hadn't received the promises that uh, had come to them and were so real to them and caused decisive actions to take place in their life. But uh, nonetheless, they lived by faith and died by faith and... Uh, so the promises to them will happen. But the better thing that it all sur is, is surrounded by is, is uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and the things we experience and walk in and have access to by faith are ours to enjoy here and now. Um, I'm reminded of something that um, Dad Hagen used to say. He said, when you receive a prophecy, that there's man's part and then there's God's part. And it's not always just if something hasn't come to pass, it's not, it's not usually. It, well, it's not God's fault if it hasn't. Yeah. There's man's part and God's part. Um, but also the scripture says in 1 John 4, 1, it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, um, you know, you'll receive a word and it may or may not really be from the spirit of God. Every one of us have the ability to flow in the spirit, walk in the spirit, hear from the spirit, but every one of us all can hear from our flesh as well. And, uh, w you know, we've, we were, um, told of a story, and I'm going to be really super vague to protect identities, but of a story that um, there was a ministry and a uh, very established ministry had been going on for quite a while, and um, one of them had passed, 
and the other was the other uh, the couple was going to continue on with the ministry, um, but they had a, a very very well known uh, minister come in and prophesy that someone else was supposed to carry on the ministry, and um, for the next year I think it was uh, the ministry had fallen less than half, less than half of the people, and um, so another man was called in to kind of help and give some direction, and the Holy Spirit led, and uh, some things were adjusted, and the man who gave the prophecy said, I missed it. Throw it away. That wasn't right. Get rid of that. I heard something, and and something was based off of my feeling, basically. And so uh, they went in and made some correction and put the right person in place, and God's growing them again. And so there was that adjustment made. So a lot of times we'll, we'll put a lot of uh, weight, it'll be weighty um, in our lives according to who we think this person is in our life. You know, um, I've had people come to me and say, oh, I've had such and such and such and such pray for me. I've had the best of the best pray for me. And then I offer to pray for them and they say, oh, I've had so and so and so and so pray for me. So there's a lot of weight put on who the person is sometimes. And in, in this case, a lot of times we can put a lot of weight on people and who they are giving us a word. And we've been prophesied over multiple times about our music and ministries and different things. And we believe in prophecy, the word says to, um, but the word also tells us to try the spirits. And like you're saying, I, I believe it, ha- it it bears witness. It's something that God's already dealing with us correct um that there's some direction and yeah. and it bears witness and a confirmation am i getting that it's based on the, a lot of, it, it needs to be based on the word of god it has to align yes with the word of god yes so that you know we have a more sure to work sure word of prophecy and that of course is uh, is the word of god it's very and important what you're doing with that prophecy before yeah. you yeah. I was uh, yeah. <coughs> I was thinking, and I've shared this many places all over the world uh, where I've gone, that uh, there uh, are two wills of God. Yeah. And uh, to for me to say that, it's kind of, you know, well, what are you trying to tell me? But I think there is a, if we see in the Word, there is a general will of God and a specific will of God. And many times we're seeking what the, specific will of God is uh, a decision a, a, a to, to, to go to a certain place or a decision to enter in a certain ministry or to marry a certain person or to whatever, make a certain choice for college and so forth. What should I do? And so that uh, that's a specific will of God. But there is a general will of God for every one of us that's right here in the pages of God's own word. And unless we're doing the general will of God mm-hmm. and, and walking in what God has showed us and, and told us in his word, uh, and if we're not doing that, it's quite unlikely that we'll find the specific will of God for your life. That's good. So it's, it's important, I think. Both. I'll, I'll say just one thing. thing. Um, there is a scripture that says that my sheep know my voice mm-hmm. and another voice they, w- they won't hear. And we have a daughter that, how long has Patsy been in the ministry? Years. And she's ministered all over and she's a, a, a speaker for women's groups and things. And a missionary right now in, uh, and a pastor's wife in Australia. And she said she had so many words given over her that she didn't care if she ever heard another personal word of prophecy. Probably the words kind of fought, you know, from this one to that one. And because who she was, she was Patsy Bierman, and they thought they, you know, I've got a word for you. She didn't didn't want it anymore. So we can hear from the Holy Ghost. Can you share that one thing you said about John 3.16 last night about the promises? It was kind of went along with what your dad was saying. That that's a it goes along with what he said. Yeah, the, there's a promise of God that even in John three sixteen, that God uh, loved us so much that He sent Jesus that nobody should perish. Right? That's prophecy over everybody. 
but it's not until you do something with that word that you actually get to live it. So even if you had it, it's like Dad said, even if you had a, a personal word, God, somebody said, this is what you're going to be, this is where you're supposed to go, this is what you're supposed to do. If you're not already honoring what God has told you in, in his word, mm -hmm. it's like Dad said, you're not going to, because it's not just that word spoken over you that's going to cause it to come to pass. It's what you do with it. Yeah, you have to appropriate if, the promise. If you say, I heard that word, but I'm going to go do something else. And, and you're, you're depending on that word to make it come to pass. It won't come to pass any more than the whole word of God. The promises in the word of God will come to pass for you if, you, if you're not doing. Along with that scripture, along with that scripture in uh, Second Peter, it says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So his will, you know, his will, his heart is that every person, every individual, wherever they are, would know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but they don't. Uh, if they hear the Word of God, reject the Word of God, it's not going to happen. Let's move on just a little bit. I, I want to hear what Dad has to share here today, too, so we, uh, <coughs> we, 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 could, we could go quite a ways. This, this should be like a college class, you know, where you just stay a couple hours. Can, can we just hang out here a little bit today, though? No. We don't have any guests here today, so we don't have to worry about whether they're going to come back or not. <laughs> Y'all are coming back, right? Y'all come back. <laughs> You're going to come back today. All right. So, but if, we, and this is special for me. This, this is going to be something I remember. Uh, this is history for me today. So, um, so, um, let's see, where, where's this, the second, uh, Where's that second question on there, Dan? The success. The success of their country. What would, what would you contribute to be uh, the most important or the, uh, the guiding um, thing that has made it possible? Now, I'm just going to preface this a, a, a little bit. At different times, it's like Dad said in that... Um, going to eastern Colorado, God provided for him. But when, when he arrived, it's like I tell people, until I left and they moved, until I finally left, we lived in a borrowed house the whole time. Actually, it was a borrowed house from the, the, the oil man. It was a provision, not it was borrowed. A, I know, but I kind of, I, I tell it that way. Because in some ways, it, you, you would say that there wasn't, uh, it's not like you were flying in an airplane and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but to me, you're 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 a testimony of God's provision, then and now, at the end of your life, yeah. uh, not the end of your life, but at at the at towards Sorry. towards in, in the older time of your life, you still have a lot before. I was talking with Dad yesterday. He said how much God is putting on him of the importance of of his days right now, and 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 what he's he's got he's given him new vision for things to do and whatnot. So I didn't mean to say it like that, but. Um, but throughout your whole life, what God is doing right now, this would not be considered to be the, the income part of your life, where you're, you're reaping from your income, and yet you are, from what you've done, what, from what you've been faithful to, God's uh, providing for you. So I see that as part of this question, is for that to have taken place, you had to be faithful to, to, to something, and... and not to hold myself up, up as an example, but I'm one of five that are called the best five alive, and so that they're not called that for nothing, you know. <laughs> but we are all serving the Lord, and we all are, you know, committed to ministry and to doing things. And what would you consider from your point of view and from what God gave you and, and you know, uh, what you were going towards that, that made it possible for God's provision to come back to you financially and also to bless maybe what something is more valuable than that, your family. Is that a good way to say that? All right. <laughs> well, I think as far as the family is concerned, you know, uh, we didn't know how to raise a family. So the Lord did lead us. Uh, they say, uh, the, but by the time you become proficient uh, at, at being a parent, you're out of a job course we we see where that that calling is still there but um, I believe 
the thing that has helped us was we just love the Lord and we was, uh, had him first in our lives and we were willing to do what he ever asked us to do. And the family and uh, church were as one. So there was never any resentment. You know, some of you guys can remember when we used to have three or four week uh, revival meetings every night and the kids were there every night. Do you know our children? And this is just because what God had put in their hearts, we couldn't make them stay home. They were afraid they were going to miss something. And they were a very part, a very vital part of the church because, uh, you know, they knew how to pray. And we had new people coming in that hadn't been filled with the Holy Spirit. And um, they'd come to the altar, and it was the youth that were praying for them. And it put hooks in their britches. <laughs> did, did. In the, now, in the old in our both. Oh, Your, yours. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and so uh, it was a family. Uh, there w- wasn't division. Like there's the teenagers and the, you know, they're, they're a little bit different. Than, no, everybody was in the church together. Everybody loved each other, prayed for each other, cared for each other. And uh, I don't know if that answers your... And Trina said, Mama, you taught us how to love Jesus and you put fences around us as a family. So they were raised up in the presence of the, of the Lord. They knew how to pray. And I, I think about you, they knew how to repent. <laughs> and they knew how to praise. <laughs> my, my, yeah. My, my, the one, my sisters and everybody impressed upon me was, um, uh, oh, what is it? Ephesians 4.32, right? Uh, mm-hmm. um, be ye kind. Be ye kind one to another, tender. That that was given to me. Per, that was my personal prophecy. That was my <laughs> be ye kind one to another, tender. Because I still have a finish it, finish it. Uh, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Yeah. And that's the key that right works. there. That it is works. the key. It works. Yeah, I still have a scar on my hand where I put my hand through the. This was still in Castle Rock. Patsy wouldn't let me in the house, and I oh my. put my hand through the storm door. Uh, the glass storm door <laughs> cut my hand. Anyway, yeah, be ye kind. I'm still working on that. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's a life. <laughs> it's a life scripture. Yeah. You know, we we have to look at any act of obedience we've done through the eyes of humility and and uh, say thanks be unto God for the grace and the help that He's given us. But does the scripture does say, "He that is faithful in that which is little, is also faithful in that which is much." And uh, I think, uh, you know, when the Lord looks at his servants and administers rewards to those servants, his words will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, So you've been faithful over that which is little. I'll make you ruler over that which is much. And so I think it's really important that you just stick with it, that you that you be faithful in little stuff and be sensitive to the Holy Spirit so that it's not the big things that's going to move you. It's the voice of God within you that you're going to heed, you're going to hear, you're going to listen to him. And, uh, and I think, you know, we're, uh, that's an important thing. I'm still, I'm still learning. A lot of times the Holy Spirit, I'll, if I consult God, when I'm trying to give a, uh, you know, add a, add a phrase. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. If I'm trying to add a phrase to a conversation or my opinion, usually if I consult the Holy Spirit, he'll say, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, the Holy Spirit can guide your life. I think in our early ministry, we knocked every door in town. I did. And uh, sometimes she was with me. Sometimes my kids were with me. Uh, but we included them in ministry. But we tried to reach out to 
to every door, every home, every, every individual in that little town of Castle Rock, Colorado. And uh, we saw very little, quite minimal results. But then God led us to Pioneer Church. Marilyn Hickey said, why don't you go to Denver? And, uh, you know, she's a voice in the kingdom of God. It was back then. And, uh, but you have to obey God. You have to do what the Holy Spirit says. And so we did, and we went out to that little dusty eastern Colorado town, and God performed Miracle. Miracles. We have stories we could just tell you one after another of the things that God has done. And uh, so uh, it didn't start out there when all of the big stuff was happening. I t little town big stuff. But it happened when we were in that other place where we didn't see things happen. We didn't see great results. We didn't see an influx of a large amount of people. I worked my, I was going to say I worked my tail off, but I worked my, I was going to say I worked my fingers to the bone, but I didn't, I still got, <laughs> but, but uh, we built a church, a beautiful little church, brick church, colored glass windows, hardwood And when he says he, he built it, he built it. Yeah, we had some help, but I was involved in every phase of the building, and uh, so, uh, after I helped that, you too. What's that? I helped yeah. you mix the concrete. Yeah. Let me tell you a story real quick. This was a two-story building, was it high up? Yeah. And Bill was up on the roof working, and uh, you can see where Steve, this was kind of a prophetic thing here. And he, he was about three years old, two and a half, three years old. He climbed up the ladder, and he got on the roof, and he said, what did he say? What, how you doing, Dad, or something? A, I don't know. He was, uh, he was, the roof had a slope on it, and he was on all fours. He'd come up the ladder, and I hadn't seen him. And he was going on all fours up the roof. We were putting on shingles. And he was saying, how am I doing, Dad? <laughs> so, uh, anyway, he had a part in that, too. Uh, I'm just saying that stick with it. Be Amen. faithful. Be faithful to God and uh, whatever you're involved in. In this church, I think I had a marvelous transition. You know, you were down the road a little ways. And uh, what a marvelous transition this is. Let's believe God to see great things happen right here in, uh, what is this called? Liberty Hill. Liberty Hill. Yeah. Yeah. See great things. I tell you what, people should be coming in. This is, you know, this is a great crowd. I met people that I hadn't met before this morning, and fabulous folks. Some are gone, you know, that I, I know they're here a lot. But you folks are amazing. And I, these guys, I just commend you for driving an hour and a half mm -hmm. each way to get yes. here. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. And uh, everybody, you know, we could just, we just pat you on the back and I, I think of the guy back there in the sound booth. He's hiding back there now. He's asleep, but he's... <laughs> but, but, you know, every person is so vital in this place. Let's, mo let's just believe God and see this place burgeon and see it multiply. Yeah. Buddy, buddy that was a people. great uh, offering sermon this morning. Great. Right on. Praise That's God. inspiring. Hallelujah. So... You know, it's, you know, it's just, uh, it's amazing what God can do. I remember, uh, this wasn't supposed to be, this is not a Mother's Day deal, but anyway. Well, we'll, 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 we'll wrap it up here and we'll. I'm running out of time. Okay. But I remember when we had a big thrust and it was in one service, we had 153 people. Uh, this was a place where we pioneered in the church. 153 people. Well, it stuck out to me because Jesus told the disciples to throw the net on the other side, and when they counted the fish, there's 153 fish. So, praise the Lord. But then we had, we doubled that, and just a little town of 3,000 people. So, God, God was just wonderfully at work. 
Hallelujah. Let's pray. Let's believe God. Amen. Let's see the supernatural take place. Amen. Lives change. People transform. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank the Lord. You know, I, I was telling Pastor Steve this. It hit me this week. You know, you hear, how many have heard that saying, uh, love God, serve people? I, I think it's wrong. I think there is no division. There is no love God. So it's love God, love people, serve God, serve people. Because if you think it's love God, okay, I'm loving God, I'm serving people, then you think you're serving people. I'm not, I'm here to serve you, yes, but I'm serving God by serving you. Everything I'm doing here is for God. I do it to you, with you, and we're doing it together, but we're doing it for him. So you see what I'm saying? Uh, I think it, it can, if you get your mind on, oh, I'm serving people, it can become laborious. It can become mundane it, it can become a job and this is not a job this is my life this is i'm loving god i'm loving people i'm serving god i'm serving people there's no division it's all together because this is the heart of god is people amen and i think that's what we've seen an example of in uh in my in-laws is they've loved god they've loved people so therefore they serve we serve amen We'll turn it over to Dad. Okay. Got to give any. Thank the Lord. In the book of Proverbs, uh, in the book of Proverbs, you want me to wait? Okay. Book of Proverbs, the tenth chapter. It talks about uh, memories, and uh, says the memory of the just is blessed. Remember reading that scripture. Uh, I was looking at it in the ERV version, and it says, the memory of good people have leave memories that bless us. And then there's another scripture along the same, uh, well, it's the same scripture in another translation. It says, we have happy memories of the godly, and then good people are remembered long after they're gone. So how many of you got some good memories about mom today? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Happy memories of Childhood, sometimes uh, memories are of, of home is not always good. But we want to talk about the moms this morning. And uh, I have memories of my mother. She's uh, long gone. She's been gone for several years. But uh, she was the first person I baptized and, uh, when I started pastoring. And uh, she was a very special lady. Uh, I remember her crocheting things, and uh, I have a I have a little poem I think I'm going to read about her. Uh, one, uh, it's a poem that she wrote, and she had a whole book of poems. She loved to write poetry, but this one says, "The door that leads to a mother's heart is always open wide, and in her heart is a special place where peace and love abide. There is no lock on a mother's heart; her children freely go for a pat on the cheek." and a comforting word or something they want to know. Through years of work and prayer, she's learned her wise and tender art, for the nearest thing to the love of God is the love of a mother's heart. So I don't know when she wrote that, but it's been a long time because I remember when I was just a little kid uh, hearing her recite that poem. So... Uh, our message today, I want to talk to you moms, uh, bring to mind a uh, uh, mother in the, in the Bible who uh, lived in uh, tough times. And so many of you uh, have gone through experiences of toughness and difficult moments. But uh, before we do, let's pray. Father, I thank you for the word of God today. I thank you for the rich fellowship that we have in Jesus. I want to thank you for this wonderful group of folks who are gathered here this morning. I pray for them. Especially, Lord, we pray for the moms, the mothers, those, oh, Father, who have spent countless hours uh, rearing our, our, uh, our children. We want to thank you for the love that has been poured into lives that result in wonderful transformations of hearts and years to come. 
We want to thank you for all that has taken place in families that are here this morning because of sweet mothers and faithful moms. We thank you, Father, for the word today. We ask you to bless it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Over in the book of Exodus, uh, I just want to just refer to a couple of things from uh, that first chapter because the people of Israel were going through difficult times. You know, it was many years before that, uh, that uh, Joseph uh, went into Egypt and, uh, and uh, he was, became the prime minister of Egypt and uh, brought his family in and uh, they were sojourners in a strange land. But now, years had passed, there was a different Pharaoh and so they were in a tremendous time of, of, of difficulty. And uh, so there were taskmasters, difficult situations were taking place uh, each, each day. And it tells us in, uh, from about the eighth verse, it says, uh, uh, Pharaoh was speaking in the tenth verse, he says, let us deal wisely with them because they, uh, they're multiplying. And it came to pass when they fall out to war, will, they will also join to our enemies and fight against us. And so they set taskmasters over these, uh, over these uh, people of God, the Israelites, and uh, it became very, very difficult for them. But uh, we're going to talk to, to you this morning about, uh, in this time, it says when they were afflicted, they multiplied. And uh, that's, a, that's a little lesson for us this morning. Uh, in times of toughness, in times whenever difficulty is taking place, a lot of times that's a time when we experience the greatest growth. And not only in uh, just a multiplication of, uh, of people, but multiplication of blessings in our life and uh, growth in our uh, experiences. But then in the second chapter, it says, There went a man of the house of Levi, and he took a wife of the daughter of Levi, and it says, the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And uh, so this was a time when it wouldn't be good to have a kid, because they were growing up in <laughs> terrible situations and uh, difficulties. And it says, uh, it says he conceived, and uh, a lot of times uh, when God is wanting to move in our lives, it happens at a time whenever we're not quite ready for it. And I remember Ginger and I got married on Christmas Eve in 1953. And on October uh, 24th, uh, 10 months later, we had our first baby. And uh, that really wasn't the best time to have a baby. And uh, I remember when the little baby was born, uh, she stuck her tongue out at me. And she didn't know what she was doing, but it was so cute. She stuck her tongue out at me. But I noticed in her mouth there wasn't a silver spoon there. And uh, so she came at a difficult time for us. And then uh, it wasn't much long, longer after that that uh, here came another. And uh, Ginger says, you know what? I think we're going to have another baby. And I says, oh, no. And uh, then the third one came. And it was another, oh, no. And then Steve, uh, you know, <laughs> there's a big, big no. We were, uh, we were just, uh, we had a handful of people. We had 13 people uh, every Sunday in church unless somebody was gone. And so it was, a, it was a tough time. But we were so happy that these kids came along. But anyway, uh, uh, the birth of Moses uh, was, a, was not at the best time. And so, surroundings, uh, situations sometimes don't always bode well for what we want to get done. And uh, it wasn't a good time to, to have a child. But uh, anyway, uh, what happened, they looked and saw this little baby, and uh, when they saw the little baby Moses, they saw that he was a goodly child. That means in the original language that he was beautiful very fair to look upon. And so they saw him that he was beautiful, a goodly child. Acts, the seventh chapter and the 20th verse, it says that, that uh, 
he was uh, he was beautiful. He was uh, he was exceedingly fair. And then 80 years later, to think that this same little child that was a beautiful little baby, lying in uh, lying in his little bed, this same little baby, the beautiful face that they saw, that face would be illuminated with the glory of God as Moses came down from the mountain. You know what? Your children may have potential that is, you know, goes beyond your imagination. I think of people with young children. I see these boys here today and others. I know that this, uh, there's a handsome guy over there, and uh, I know he's a joy to his parents. But your kids will have awesome, they may have awesome futures ahead of them. And you know, you not only see them in their little cute faces, the beautiful little features and the little countenance that they have, but we see beyond that. And godly mothers see something inside of their children that is something that is only given them of God, and they see potential. They see the things that can emerge from this little helpless child that God has placed in their hands. And so we see that his parents looked upon him, and uh, we, uh, we saw that they, he had such a beautiful little countenance. And it says that when they looked upon him, they, they hid him in an ark. We go over to the book of, of Hebrews, the, the faith chapter, the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, and it talks about Moses when he's born. It says, by faith Moses, when he was born, uh, it says, his parents hid him for three months because they saw that he was a goodly child and they saw that there was something in his future. There was something beautiful about him. And there was something that had potential. I believe the Holy Spirit prompted the heart of the mother of Moses to see that this man had something that was beyond the natural. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that the Holy Spirit can put faith in your heart for your kids, for your little children? For the sons and the daughters that have been birthed into your home. And uh, they tell a story. I was reading a story when I was uh, studying about this. About uh, two, over 200 years ago. And uh, in England, there was a, a pastor of a church. And uh, he had a large family. And uh, one night in the parsonage of this church, a fire started unknown to them. But when they discovered uh, that the house was engulfed in fire, they got the children out and fled the house uh, to a place of safety. But then as they counted the children, they realized that one of the little children was missing. And so someone who was called to the fire put a ladder to the window, went into the house, and found the little baby in the house and brought him out and put him in his father's arms. And... Uh, you know, uh, what would have happened if that little child had, a, had perished in, that, in the flames of that home, that parsonage? That child's name was John Wesley. And so think of that, the tremendous impact that that one man has had across the Christian world. And had he perished in that fire, we would have never known, perhaps the church history would have never experienced what has gone, uh, what has taken place because of him, the hymns that he wrote, and all of these things that came about through his life. The importance and the value of every individual, every single child. You see, Moses was a man with two mothers. The role of each was different, but he had two moms, and very, both of them had a very important place in this little child's life. Pharaoh pronounced a death sentence, but his own daughter saved the life of one who was sentenced to die. And she saved Moses' life. And it says in Acts 7, she nourished him as her own. And uh, this, this little child went from a place of persecution to the palace. 
And think of the influence that that, uh, that Egyptian society had upon this little boy. He was trained, the Bible tells us in the seventh chapter of the book of Acts, it says he was trained in all the knowledge, understanding, and, and education of Egypt. And he was proficient in all of these things. He is mighty in word and mighty in deed. And it says he grew up there, spent his first 40 years there in that, in that palace. And so here he was just immersed in Egyptian society. But there is something very powerful and very wonderful that took place in his life. And it wasn't because of the Egyptian society as, as knowledgeable as they were in medicine, in science, in astrology, and all of these things. It wasn't those things that left its imprint upon his life, though that what they did have an effect upon him. But it was the influence of his mother. She was a woman of faith. Go with me over to the book of Hebrews, and uh, let's look in the 11th chapter. Uh, Hebrews 11, 23. It says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents, because they saw that he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the, kingdom, uh, the king's commandment. We see through two evidence of, uh, uh, of faith in the heart and in the life of Moses' mother and father. And uh, I would like to notice, I'd like you to notice that it wasn't just his mother's faith. You know, moms, we appreciate you so much in the, 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 the walk with God and the fellowship that you have with God and your heart for God. You have a heart that longs for God. But I tell you what, one of the things that underscores that and helps that and makes that most effective is when you have a husband standing beside you and he has like faith and you work together, you, you cooperate, you blend your faith, you stand in agreement in certain situations. I appreciate my wife so much. She is a woman of faith and she stands, uh, you know, she stands on the word for healing. She's experienced healing. And she encourages me that way. But we see that this, this is important. But we see something about her. They saw that he was a beautiful child. And then there was revelation as to this child, what he would become. You know, faith goes beyond the visible. Amen. What you see is a beautiful little child. Everybody cuddles and holds their little finger and, you know, and, uh, you know, bounces them around a little bit. And, you know, we just love these little babies. But, you know, the mother sees something beyond that. Godly mothers see that this child can emerge from an ordinary life and climb to a place and an elevation where they will be used mightily of God. And I believe that there's lives that have been changed simply because a mom stood in her place and sat in the place of faith to trust God to see marvelous things done in the life of their sons and daughters. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And then we see that there's something else about faith that we see in, in his mother and her father, in his father. And that was this, that they did not fear the king's commandment. And that's a part of faith, isn't it? A lot of times the devil will scare you to, out, of your, out of your wits concerning your kids and what routes you, 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 you fear that they're taking. But I tell you what, you need to be steadfast. Don't fear what the enemy is doing to undercut them, undermine them in their walk with God. Let's trust in God. Believe in God, moms. Amen? So she saw something there, and she was not afraid of the king's commandment. And then we see something else. Her faith with her husband's faith prompted action. You know, if it's, if it's just faith, and it's just something that you say, ah, oh, I've got faith, you know, and there's nothing in evidence about that faith. There's nothing to, to, to tell you that there's something that works 
that, that, that brings about change, that enacts something that touches God, that transforms situations of life. And, uh, you know, a lot of times you, people are satisfied with that kind of faith. But if you've got Bible faith, it'll bring about action. There'll be changes that take place whenever that kind of faith is in evidence. And so it says, uh, it says by faith, Hebrews eleven seven, by faith Noah prepared an ark. Isn't that interesting? Noah, it says, moved by fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his house. And so the mother of... Moved by fear. By faith, Noah, moved by fear, prepared an ark. Fear is an important thing. I want to talk about it. Okay? Praise the Lord. So, uh, it says, Moses, moved by, uh, by fear, prepared... By faith, Moses, moved by fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his house. And uh, Moses' mother, she built an ark for the saving of her son. Isn't that interesting? Praise God. So we see that the, the ark of protection was formed by action taken by the mom and the dad. And so it provided Noah a place after he worked on this thing for a long, long time, building the ark. I don't know how long Moses' mother worked, but nonetheless, it served the same purpose, that that child that was given to her by God, that little child so beautiful, that little child with a purpose in his life would be protected from the king's command to slay all these male children. Isn't that interesting? Praise God. We see something in the, in the time of Jesus a wicked king enacted a decree to kill all the male children. And the, the, the parents of Jesus took him into Egypt. And it was in Egypt where this little baby Moses was protected by an ark prepared by his mother. And I think fear is an important thing. Faith is the absence of the fear of man. Praise God. Whenever you have faith, somehow it diminishes and obliterates what man will do to you. What is going to happen because of the circumstances that are around you. When you have faith that is from God, somehow you realize that God emerges stronger and mightier. And uh, whatever is happening, God will see to it that you come safely through. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, the presence of the fear of God is important too. The absence of, uh, in faith, faith is the absence of the fear of man. And it says she did not fear the commandment of the king. The presence of the fear of God, that's faith. Amen. That is, that is involved in faith. If you don't have the fear of God, it's probably your faith is not going to work very well. But whenever Moses, or whenever, excuse me, whenever Noah was given the command to build an ark, it says he was moved by fear. Amen. And he wasn't, it wasn't the fear of man, but it was the fear of God. You know, I believe that there is an important element that is necessary to the church, the successful church uh, at, at any time, at any age. And that's the fear of God. Amen. Amen. The fear of God, uh, the fear of man brings us snare, but the fear of God brings reverence into the house of God, which welcomes the presence of God to work and to move in the midst of his people. Praise God. So we see that... These things took place in this woman of faith. She had to utilize her time. In other words, whenever 
uh, little Moses was hidden. He was hidden for three months. And then when Pharaoh's daughter found little Moses in the ark of bulrushes, whenever she found him, she hired Moses' mother to nurse him. And I don't know how long that was. Maybe three, four years. But during that time, she utilized that time to impart some stuff into that little child's life that would never leave him. I believe that things can be imparted into your kids at an early age, and those things will never leave them. Those things will stick with them in the most difficult times, times of challenge. So she did this. She instilled faith in him. What will faith-filled teaching do for your children? What will faithful, faith-filled teaching do to your sons? Well, I'll tell you what it'll do. It'll build generational results. Praise God. What will happen will last through their life and on into the next generation. I think of Timothy. Paul talked about to Timothy, and he spoke of his grandmother, the faith that was in his grandmother. And then it passed to his mother, and then it says, it's in you too. Praise God. So we see what you trip, what you impart to your children in your walk with God, with your, with, in your faith in God, as you do that, it's going to touch their lives and affect them for their life and for the generations to come. And so it says, she instilled faith in him. And then she did something else. She clarified to him his identity. He must know who he is. How important that is for a child to know who he is. And we know what we are in Christ. If we study the word, we discover that we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. Yeah, we are a chosen generation. We're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that we should offer the praises to God. Amen. So we see that she clarified to him his identity. We go back to our roots. We go back to where it all began. God called Moses out of the land of Ur of the Chaldees. And he, he, uh, God told Moses, or, uh, Abraham, excuse me, God told Abraham, he said, I have a plan for you. Leave your country. And then when he made the covenant with Abraham, he told him, he says, you'll be a blessing to every nation. All the, uh, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because of you. And so, this mother of Moses told him, you have, you have a heritage. You are a different kind of people. You're in Egypt, but Egypt is not in you. You are a different individual from those who surround you. Amen. So these kids, when they grow up, we can grow up and uh, let them grow up, and they can, uh, they can learn all about what's going around them, the things that are hip, the things that are in, all of that. But what they need to know is who they are because of Jesus Christ. What has taken place inside of their life, their destiny. Abraham, it talks about, he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker was God. These kids would have eternity in their hearts. Praise God. Not living for the moments of time alone, but living with an eternal destiny. What they, where they are in the world would be, would be uh, influenced by what they are in Christ. Yeah. And what they would do in this world would be influenced by their tether, that which goes beyond the veil, that which is inside the heavenlies, that which it hooks them up with heaven itself. And your kids... Our kids, we need to have heaven in our hearts. Amen. We need to know that we are, we are eternal people. Amen. Time is passing. It's going to swiftly fade away. But the things of eternity 
are going to be ours forever. Praise the Lord. Everything we do needs, in this life needs to be regulated by who we are and what we, where we're destined. Praise God. I really believe that. I really believe that. I believe it's important that we know that this world is not my home. <laughs> Praise God. I'm going to be the best influence I can be while I'm here. Whatever I'm doing, I'm going to be good at it. But this world is not my home. Remember the song, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are there, not here. I've got stuff, but stuff doesn't have me. Praise the Lord. Some ministers got together and bought me a brand new Ford pickup. Uh, what do they call it? King Ranch. King Ranch. King Ranch pickup. And it does stuff I don't even know what it'll do. <laughs> Just an amazing thing. I don't know, I think, you know, it, it, they, don't, they don't just give them away. But some pastors got together and gave me one last year. Hallelujah. But I tell you what, I enjoy that thing that we love to ride in that. It's so spacious. Even my wife, you know, she can, she can widen out a little bit. <laughs> it, it, it's, a, it's a marvelous machine. It's a driving machine. <laughs> you know, I, I've had a lot of nice cars. But, but this is awesome. But I tell you what, this chariot I'll leave behind. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. There's another place that I'm going. But I won't need that. That's right. I'm thankful for it. I believe God had a hand in it, and I give him all the glory. Amen. But, praise the Lord, I don't want my treasures to be locked up in four <coughs> tires and a four-wheel drive vehicle. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, anyway, we need to know, our kids need to know, moms, we need to forge it into their hearts that this life lived to its fullness. That's what we want to do. We want it to be lived in its fullness to the glory of God. Amen. 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 Praise the If it's fullness any other way, it's not fullness. It's empty. It has some little rattling to it, but it's not the real deal. Praise God. I want to wrap it up here pretty quick. Mom's teaching helps kids to make tough choices. Hebrews 11. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, what did he do? He refused. You know, that I got to thinking about that. that that'd, that'd be tough. You know, this daughter of the king was good to him. She did, she did all kinds of stuff for him. She provided an amazing education for him. And uh, history says that, uh, you know, he was, uh, he was a general over an army. Uh, it doesn't say that in the Bible, but it, it tells us that. Uh, historians tell us that. And it says he was an amazing man, mighty in word and deed. Well, why was it that, you know, uh, later on, 40 years after he took off, he said, you know, I'm slow, slow of speech. I, 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 I can't go before Pharaoh. Well, you know, you, you sit on your gift and how you've been used for 40 years, and it probably won't work too well. <laughs> but anyway, he was mighty in word and deed. And, uh, but at that juncture in his life, when his calling began to stir with inside of him, there's something that he did. He refused to be influenced by what Pharaoh's daughter could give him. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. 
Praise God. He chose rather, so he refused and he chose. You know, life involves some choices for your kids. And what you share with those boys and those little girls will have an influence on their choices down the road. Amen. And he chose rather to do what? To suffer affliction with the people of God. Can you imagine that? That doesn't make sense, does it? Who wants to suffer? Who wants to go through tough times? Who wants to be castigated and looked down on? I don't think any of us want that. But what he did, he looked unto the recompense of his reward. Praise God. He forsook Egypt, not forsaking the king, and he endured. Do you want to endure? That means you last. You don't quit. You continue. You stay on course. How do you endure? Because he saw him who was invisible. Praise God. The faith-filled people see that which is not visible to the natural. Who can impart that better than a mom? Moms, we're calling upon you, young and old today, to think of the value of your little child. That little boy, that little girl inside the care and keeping of your home, your household. And what you do or don't do will affect the choices that they make or don't make in the days to come. How many would like you, you to, how many would like for your children to make good choices? The obvious answer is yes, isn't it? So, the impartation. What about grandmas? I tell you what, your role is vital, very vital, very important. Amen. The wisdom with which you speak, the experience you bring with you, the things that you can share with those little kids, children, and especially a godly mother, a godly grandmother, will influence their lives to make the right choices. Amen. So, verses 24 to 27 speaks about that. But then in verse uh, 24, it says he refused. And then in verse 26, he discerned what the true riches are. The true riches are not what you accumulate put in your pocket or bank account or the real estate that you may have or whatever, you know, you would put vital importance upon. But true riches are heavenly riches. Where are your treasures, mothers, this morning? Amen. So what she did, <clears throat> she taught him to discern what true riches were. Then her fearless faith was taught to him. Praise God. She, you know, she did not fear the king's commandment. And it says then in verse number 27, it says, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Amen. Things are happening in this old world today. Things are taking place. The news media brings it out so eloquently and probably exaggeratively today. But things are taking place in this world, and things are going to things are going to happen. But how do you enter? How do you deal with the times? How do you deal with the seasons we're in right now? The the insecurity, those things that are somehow timorously hold in a balance. I tell you what, today is by faith in God. And she taught that to him. Praise God. She imparted it to him. And he did not fear the wrath of the king. Then in Hebrews 3, 5, it talks about that. I didn't need to read that, so let me go. Hebrews 3, 5 says, Moses Verily was faithful. You know what, what faith imparted to a child will do? It'll produce faithfulness in that child. 
And it says here that Moses, uh, Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony to those who were to be spoken after. You know what? Was it Kim? You brought this out? Servant? Did you say something about servant a while ago? Amen. One of the things you can teach your little kids is uh, to serve. I saw the little boys working here today. I admire you guys. And uh, I think of how important it is. I like you Southerners. You guys are amazing. Uh, you Texans, especially. Uh, my, my grandson-in-law comes from Texas. And uh, <clears throat> when, when he and Alicia were going together, I thought, what did Alicia do? Because <laughs> he's, he's not a very big guy, you know. <laughs> And, uh, you know, and, and then he sported some kind of a hairdo. <laughs> and so I thought, what on earth is Alicia <laughs> doing? And oh, I hope he's not on, I hope you don't catch this. Uh, but I, I think I've told him before. But, you know, that, that young man has earned my respect mm -hmm. because he is a servant. That young man has a place in my heart. Because he teaches his children now to look up at granddad and say, yes, sir, no, sir. Look at grandma and say, no, ma'am, yes, ma'am. I like that. I like it where people are taught respect and honor, and they serve. Praise God. We had an 80th birthday party for me a few years ago. I won't tell you how many years ago, I'll tell you my age. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> we had, yeah, it was an outdoor deal. So I had Caleb park the cars. I had him direct people where to park the cars. Because I knew that that first meeting that those people would have would be a good one. And he'd say, he'd say to them, yes, ma'am, just pull right in here. We'll have a cart for you to ride over to the place we're going to have the, the party. And he would be real kind to everyone that he met. He had learned to be a servant. Amen. So that is passed on. It's a genera generational thing that can be passed down by mothers today. You know, it's a special day for you gals. We love you. And we're so thankful for every mom that is here. Amen. It talks about, in Proverbs 14, 1, it says, every wise woman builds her house. And I just believe by faith today, each one of us, uh, I say us, each one of you mothers can step into that role of a mom of faith. A mom who can talk uninhibited to your children about the realities of the Bible, of walking with God, serving the Lord. I believe this with my heart today. So we want to honor you. And what I'd like to do is have families, if they would, gather around mom and uh, pray for her. Could we just do that today?